the superposition principle says that the general solution for a non-homogeneous differential equation uh, is based on collecting all the fundamental solutions for the homogeneous differential equations. By fundamental solutions, we're talking about a set of solutions that are linearly independent. And the number of solutions match the order of your differential equation. So the general solution for the non-homogeneous will include a linear combination of all of these fundamental solutions plus uh, one particular solution that would satisfy the non-homogeneous differential equation. So the first step in doing these problems is the homogeneous part. Yeah. Yep, 4.4. We're going to skip 4.5, by the way. They have the same results, and we just do it a slightly different way. Although it has a cooler name, though. It's called the annihilator method. As opposed to undetermined coefficients. So, anyways... Let's let's take a look at a problem and then we'll take a look at the some of the aspects of this method. Number one is always a good place to start. <clears throat> so we have a differential equation here. Uh, y double prime plus 3y prime plus 2y is equal to 6. Non-homogeneous because the other side has a number, not, that's not 0. So what we want to do is we want to find the general solution. In finding the general solution, you first want to find the fundamental solutions for the homogeneous portion. And then we'll talk about how to find a solution for the non-homogeneous portion, the y sub p. So first, find solution to homogeneous differential equation. Uh, y double prime plus 3y prime plus 2y is equal to 0. And so, back when we were first starting off, when we were still inexperienced, we would say y equals e to the mx, and then take the derivative a couple of times, plug it in. But now we're all good at this. So m squared plus 3m plus 2 is your characteristic equation that you would have extracted out of that. And then since you're really good at algebra, you can factor this quickly in your head. m plus 1, m plus 2. And so m equals minus 1 and minus 2 would be your solutions. And you know that in one of the three cases, this is a case where you have two distinct real roots. And so this is the first and easy case where your solution is just e to the one of those times x, and the other one is e to the other one of those times x. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, not, call, we'll not introduce the c's yet. We'll just say y1 equals e to the minus 2x and y2 equals e to the minus x. <clears throat> Last time somebody asked how you know which is which, and the answer is that it doesn't matter which is which, and I think I left it at that last time, but this time I want to add on the fact that it doesn't matter which is which, but you need to be consistent when we start working with this a little bit later on, <laughs> whatever that means. Yeah. 
Yes. But you have to do that first. You have to do that first. And so this is going to be part of your solution. So now the question we have is we need to find a particular solution, y sub p. And we want to know what that's going to look like. And so just like we've done before, we're going to guess what this is going to be. Um, let's throw out some guesses. What do you think this will be? Four. Any other guesses? What? C? Any other guesses? <laughs> 21? <laughs> Not exactly the guesses that I was looking for. Uh, I was kind of looking for more like uh, E to the MX or E to the CX or something like that. But you guys are kind of right, though. I don't know. Jay just said three. Why did you? How did you come up with three? Oh, is that some gang sign or something? Oh, oh, oh just an okay. <laughs> All right, uh, <clears throat> um, I think the answer is three. So let's think about it. And what we want to do is think about uh, well, I mean, if we look at the differential equation itself and and we think, okay, we need to find a function y so that the derivative, the first, the second derivative plus three times the first derivative plus two times the original function is equal to six. Well, I think if it was a constant, then all those derivatives would go away, right? And so y itself would just be would just be a number. If it was a constant, somebody said c. Um, so if we're going to guess that y is equal to a constant and you take the derivatives and then you can eventually solve for y so maybe take a guess guess that y sub p is equal to a constant and i know constants we usually use c but for this section we're going to start using capital a b and c kind of like a I don't know. When we were doing uh, partial fractions, I think we used capital letters or something. Anyways, that doesn't matter. Uh, first and second derivatives are zero. So when you plug that a constant in there, um, then things are going to disappear. And so we just have 2 times a is equal to 6. So 2 is equal to... Huh. That's a is equal to three, right? So that's your y sub p just happens to be constant. Now it's not always going to be like this. Oh, I put two times y sub p. Uh, maybe I should have done that. So zero plus. 0 plus 2y sub p equals 2a. Because y, this should be y sub p, I guess. Because y sub p is equal to a, a constant. And so the first derivative and the second derivative are all equal to 0. Right? The derivative of a constant is 0, and then the second derivative is 0 also. So, yeah, I think that would be it. Well, we put it together, and um, and then we have our final answer. 
A is a guess of what y sub p should equal to. <laughs> She's not happy. We'll see. We'll keep practicing and we'll. Well, we're guessing y sub p. Uh, and we were going to guess, uh, a lot of you guys just threw out numbers for your answers. And so. Then, then it would be two. Yeah. But but this is a simple example. Uh, our our right hand side, right? Our right hand side is a constant, and so this this is easy to guess what it might be. Uh, if we take a look at another example where your right hand side's uh, like x squared or something like that, then it's a little bit different. So we we want to be a little bit more careful with that. So, anyways, to actually wrap this up and come up with a with a final answer. Our general solution for the non-homogeneous differential equation is a linear combination of y1 and y2 plus the y sub p that we just got, which is a, which is 3. So our general solution for the whole thing is going to be y is equal to uh, C1 e to the negative 2x plus C2 e to the negative x plus y sub p, which is a, which is 3, and then this is your answer. And we haven't been doing this, but you know, ideally you would take this, uh, take a couple of derivatives and put it back to the original differential equation to check to make sure that you're getting the right answer. Yes. No, ask. Yes. So, so this is our first step. Step one, we found the y1 and y2. Right? Now, step two is this. Find y sub p. That's our step two. And right now, what I'm proposing is that we just guess what y sub p is. And we guess that y sub p is a constant, a. We'll call it a. And then so, because y sub p has to satisfy the non-homogeneous differential equation, then we're going to use the original non-homogeneous differential equation. Now, that's different from step one, because in step one, we solved for the homogeneous differential equation. That's how we found the fundamental solutions. So that's step one. Step two, we're going to find a solution for the non-homogeneous portion, which is why we're using six here instead of zero. Yes. Yes. And that's how we got that's how we got three. And then step three, we just put it all together. Okay. No, we want it to be different from y1 and y2. So once we find y1 and y2, we're going to set that aside. 
And then now we're going to focus on this problem. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's a good warm up. It's a constant. And then our guess is that, well, our y sub p must be also be a constant. Uh, so now let's do another problem where the right hand side might not be constant. Let's do number four. No, let's do number three. Wait, no, yeah, let's, number three is okay. So we'll go through the steps again. The first step is to solve the non the, the homogeneous portion. And then the homogeneous is y dull prime minus 10y prime plus 25. y is equal to 0. <clears throat> So it's a repeated root 5, <laughs> right? So our characteristic equation is going to be m squared minus 10m plus 25 is equal to 0. And we factor that, we got m minus 5 twice. So we could do the reduction formula, but we know the result there. The result is just we multiply it by x. Okay. So I'll put dot, dot, dot here because, well, I don't even put dot, dot, dot because you guys can figure it out. After you do this enough times, you'll see that your solutions are going to be e to the 5x and then x e to the 5x. That's our first part. Probably, as long as you get it right. Yeah. If you get it wrong, then I, I can't find any partial credit to give you, so. <laughs> All right, so now we have this. I could skip steps because if I get it wrong, you guys would just tell me. <laughs> yeah. So the idea here now for step two. Um, find y sub p and we're going to guess first. And I'll change your letters a little bit, Edgar, but it doesn't matter. Bx plus c, ax plus b, whatever. Um, so why did you guess this? Because <laughs> you're red ahead. <laughs> That's an excellent answer, by the way. We're kind of just matching the right-hand side there. We got 30x plus 3. That looks like a linear function, a linear function ax plus b. So maybe it is the y sub p is going to be a linear function also. So that's what's going to happen. That's that's the pattern that we're going to see here is that whatever's on the right-hand side, uh, your guess for y sub p is going to be pretty much that same type of function the right-hand side of the non-homogeneous. So 30x plus 3 is a linear function. So my guess, Edgar's guess, was a linear function for y sub p. And so y sub p, why don't we let it equal to ax plus b, and then we'll hopefully be able to solve for 
A and B. So that's the deal. Um, so we need a couple of derivatives here to match it up with the actual differential equation. Uh, y P prime is equal to A, is that right? And Y P double prime is gonna and just end up being zero. And we'll put that information into the original differential equation. So we have zero minus 10 times A plus 25 times AX plus B is equal to 30 plus three. And if we work all this stuff out, it looks like it's just going to be a, a matching up like, like uh, Did I? Oh, yeah, there's an X. That was an X there. It was really small. I couldn't see it. 25A. Whoa. 25A times X. That's the X terms. And then the non X terms are going to be um, B, 25B. Minus 10a. That's on the left hand side. On the right hand side, it'll stay the same, but then now you get to match up the coefficients of the x's and and the non x terms, the constant terms. So we're going to get uh, 25a should equal to 30. Right? The left hand side is supposed to equal the right hand side. The thing with the x, coefficients of the x should match up. We got 25a is equal to 30. And at the same time, um, 25b minus 10a is equal to 3. So we have two equations and two unknowns that we're solving for. One of them we can solve easily. You're just matching the coefficients. So again, kind of like uh, when you guys were doing uh, partial fractions, you did something, you common denominator thing, and then you got these things with an x squared and an x and then the constant, and then on the other side is some x squared and x and a constant, and then you match up the coefficients. That's basically what we're doing. So if a is equal to six fifths, we'll put a back into the second equation. By the way, you know, two equations, two unknowns, you can make a linear system, you can make it into a matrix or do whatever you want, but solve for it any way you can, just like you did back in, again, partial fractions. So we got 25b is equal to 10, oops, minus 10 times six fifths. I guess those would cancel. That's 12, bring to the other side, add 12 plus 3 is 15, so B is equal to 3 fifths, right? So this took a little bit more effort, right? Because, you know, we had more things to solve for last time. We just had an A and that was easy. This time we had a, a linear function but and then two coefficients to solve for but we found them so your y sub p will equal to uh, a which is six fifths times x plus b which is three fifths so here is your particular solution and again the last step is put it all together Step three, you get your general solution. I usually do this in red. Uh, y is equal to C1 times e to the 5x plus C2 times x e to the 5x plus y sub p, 6 fifths x plus 3 fifths.
and put this into the, the original differential equation, you should get the true statement. Okay. Any questions? So what we've been doing is uh, it's called the method of undetermined coefficient. That's the official name. And it's a matter of matching things up. Now, it's not always going to be that easy. <laughs> it never is. Um, because there is some, um, there are some special cases that might come up. Well, these aren't the special cases. <laughs> no, this is the easy part. Oh, my table is not coming out right. So the idea is that you're going to come up with uh, a function times uh, a coefficient. And if you look at a constant, we can imagine that your function is 1. And then you have a coefficient a, which is what we did in the first one. Uh, this does work only for special cases, polynomials, the exponential functions, uh, sine and cosine, and combinations of those polynomials times exponentials and or sines and cosines. When you start going into tangents, when you start going into the logs, we're going to need to do something else. So this is a special uh, method that works only for these types of functions. So anything that is linear, even if it doesn't have, the, it doesn't have that extra constant, uh, you would still generalize to a linear term, ax plus b. Anything that's quadratic to the second power, right, uh, regardless of things that may or may not be there, like an x term or a constant term, uh, would generalize to the general quadratic. So if I had just x squared on the right-hand side, my undetermined coefficient is still going to have to be ax squared plus bx plus c, because the b and the c might have gone away to zero or something like that on the right hand side, but you know we want to account for all that. Uh, the sine and cosine, as we saw with the imaginary numbers, complex conjugates, they're going to be coming in pairs too. So if there's a sine in there, assume that there might be a cosine in there that might have just disappeared. If there's, or if it's just a cosine, then assume that there's a sine in there. Exponential functions are generally easy, but now when you start combining polynomials with exponentials, then you're going to have to do the general polynomial times the exponential, whatever that power is for the exponential. And to make things more interesting, if you have a polynomial times a sine or a cosine, then you have a polynomial in front of a sine and a different polynomial instead of a cosine I said that backwards, but you get the idea. <clears throat> okay. So I doubt we'll get to any problems that would represent be represented in the bottom. Maybe your homework or something. You guys might have to do homework. <laughs> but that's a lot of variables uh, or coefficients to, to solve for. But you can imagine what you did in uh, the partial fractions when you were in Calc 2 and how how deep your instructor got you into that. I, I'm probably just going to go as far as A, B, and C. That's probably good enough for me. All right. So um, special cases, caveats, we'll, we'll get to that after we do a couple of these first. And then uh, we'll uh, throw some curveballs at you. 
All right, let's see if we can find another problem here. Um, let's try number eight. Um, you can divide by four, but I, I, I think I'll just keep it like that and, and then, um, cause it, it'll all be based on the characteristic equation. So let's see how this is going to work for us. Let's, um, do our first step. Do this with the right color. Whoa, what happened? ones please. <clears throat> All right, let's see if we can uh, solve for the homogeneous portion. We're going to assume that the right hand side is equal to zero, find our y1 and y2 from there, and then um, see what we get. So with a Substitution that we need to make, uh, we're going to come up with uh, 4m squared minus 4m minus 3 equals 0. And uh, if you could factor this, great. I don't think I could factor it off the top of my head, so I'm probably going to dive into the quadratic formula, which is something like uh, negative b, so that's a negative negative 4, plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac, a is 4, c is negative 3, so that will make uh, the thing under the square root a positive, so we're not going to be dealing with complex numbers here, uh, divided by 2a. So we have a 4 plus or minus the square root of what's happening in here. we got a 16, 16, we can factor out a 16. Uh, and then we'll just have two left. What is it? So what is it? Negative one half. Okay, so we have our solutions, and so we have our our um, our fundamental solution. Y one equals e to the minus one half x. Y two is equal to e to the three halves x. Okay, step one, done. <laughs> so step two, our y sub p now, because y has a cosine, we have to also include the possibility of getting a sine in here. So our y sub p, is going to be um, some coefficient times cosine 2x plus another different coefficient times sine 2x. And so we need to take some derivatives, put it back into the original equation, and then solve for these things. So let's take some derivatives. Y p prime is derivative cosine is negative sine, and there's a 2 that comes out because of the coefficient. Negative 2a sine 2x. Uh, derivative of sine is positive cosine, and there's a 2 that comes out. And then one more time um, a 2 
stays negative for a cosine 2x plus another 2 goes negative That's a sine 2x. We'll take all those and put it back into the differential equation for y double prime, y prime, and the original y. Set it equal to 2x and see if we can put things together. Uh, so we have uh, 4 times y double prime. That's a minus 4a cosine 2x minus 4b sine 2x. And there's another 4 next to the y prime with a negative. y prime is minus 2a sine 2x plus 2b cosine 2x. And then we have a 3 times y with a negative. y is equal to a cosine 2x plus b sine 2x. Now this is eventually going to equal a... Yeah, well, put stuff together, do something. This is going to equal to this. And so let's see if we can collect all the sines and cosines together, because it looks like that's going to be the way to go. <clears throat> so I'm going to, I was going to say single underline. I'm going to single underline the cosines and see if I can match the coefficients here. So I have a negative 16a. For this cosine, for this cosine, I have a negative 8b. And then for this cosine, I have a negative 3a. So negative 16, negative 3, negative 19a. Negative 19a times cosine of 2x. So now I want to collect the signs, so I'll double underline those. And I have a 4 and negative 4, that's negative 16b for this one. Um, this one is going to be negative, negative, that's a positive 8a, positive. And then negative 3b for that one. So what do I have that's circled? 8a. All right, I'm missing something with the cosine. Sorry. The cosine, back to the cosine, I only added uh, negative 3a and negative 16, but I also have a negative 8b with the cosine. All right, back to the sign. They're circled. Uh, I have a positive 8a and then negative 3, so it's negative 19b sine 2x. Now, this is equal to 2 times cosine 2x. It's actually, yeah. What? Oh, yeah. I'm trying to get rid of it. Let's try the eraser method. cosine 2x. <clears throat> so this is going to equal a cosine 2x. And on the left-hand side, we have something with a sine and a cosine. So uh, it's not there, but 
it's there. You can think about it. What's missing here? In terms of trying to match things up with the other side. Sign, right? Uh, so what has to be multiplied with the sign? So there's a zero in front of the sign because that's not there. But we're kind of explicitly putting it there so that we can uh, match up our coefficients. Just like we match up the coefficients with, a, with the polynomials, with the sines here and cosines, we can also match up the coefficients. So now we have two equations and two unknowns. And for this one, you probably do want to write it up. Uh, and I don't know if you want to do a matrix or whatever. So that's a minus 19a minus 8b is equal to 1. And 8a minus 19b is equal to 0. Okay, so you do what you got to do. I'm going to go to Wolfram Alpha. <laughs> Solve negative 19a, was it a minus 8b, what, equals 1, and then 8a plus or minus 19b equals 0. Good thing I didn't try to solve for it. Oh, you know what? You know what we should do? Now that we know the answer. <laughs> no. Um, um, this is a two by two matrix. I think we can use, uh, what's that? What's that? <laughs> no. Um, let me let me show you a, a cool trick. Well, I think it's cool. What? The first one. So there's this thing called Kramer's rule. Have you heard of Kramer's rule? Yeah. yeah. So Kramer's rule, you have you have a two by two matrix. Actually, this would work with any size matrix, but two by two is easy because we're doing determinants. Yeah, it's something over something. Right. So we'll take a look at the uh, determinant. We'll call it a triangle. <laughs> for D determinant, uh, it's going to be the determinant of minus 19 minus 8, 8 minus 19. And this is equal to, uh, what's 19 squared? I don't know. 381, for sure. Come on. 19 times 19, 361. So it'll be 361 minus negative 64. So what is this equal to? Four Hey, that was like the denominator of that thing, right? All right. So for A, uh, let's do the, the delta A for the first one. And what you're going to do is you're going to, if you're solving for A, that's the first column. 
you're going to replace the first column with the with the right hand side, zero one. So you're going to put uh, or one zero. Okay. So you see what I did? I took the first column and I replaced it with one zero. So that would be negative nineteen. And then the determinant of uh, B is negative 19, 8. And then you're going to replace the second column with, uh, with the right-hand side, which is 1, 0. So negative 19, that's gone. So that's minus 8. Minus 8, right? So then that's it. Your solutions are here. So given all this stuff, your A will be... Uh, the delta A over delta, so a negative 19 divided by 425, and B is equal to uh, delta B over delta, which is negative 8 over 425. Was that right? Was that right? Bam. All right. Kramer's rule. What? <laughs> yeah, and we never use it until we actually need to use it. So. <laughs> All right. So we have A and B. We have our uh, our y sub one and y sub two, and so we're done for writing your answer. So your general solution will be the linear combination of the uh, y1 and y2 and then your coefficients that you just found attached to the sine and the cosine. So which one was sine, which one was cosine? Uh, the a was attached to the cosine. So that's a minus 19 over 425 times cosine and minus 8 over 425 times sine. Okay. That was fun. I almost got excited. <laughs> Questions? Okay. All right. <clears throat> so now, curveball. Oh, by the way, I keep saying you should check this, so we'll pretend that we did and just move on. So the special cases deal with the fact that your results have to be linearly independent. So not only do your, do your fundamental solutions, your y1 and y2, not only do they have to be linearly independent, but the y sub p should also be linearly independent. Is that, was that said in here? y sub p, particular solution, nth order differential equation, it didn't say it, but it has to be linearly independent. So uh, <clears throat> we will have an issue if we do the homogeneous solutions and the fundamental solutions and we get whatever we got. And then it happens, one of those or both of those happen to match the right-hand side of your non-homogeneous differential equation. So when that happens, we need to work that out. There's something that we need to do. Let me see if I can scan for an example that might have something like that.
number nine might have something like that. Can you do that in your head, number nine? So m squared minus m, you factor out an m, m is equal to zero, m, m is equal to zero is a constant. Okay, yep, that works. You're just starting to get used to it, right? It's becoming easy, and then all of a sudden there's these weird things that are going to come up. <clears throat> all right, if we follow through the steps, uh, the first step is the homogeneous differential equation. Um, So we solve for the homogeneous differential equation to get our fundamental solution. So we got y, uh, or let's just do it, um, m squared minus m is equal to 0, factor out an m. So m is equal to 0, and m is equal to 1. So we got e to the 0, hmm, that's just 1. So y1 is equal to a constant 1, and y2 is equal to e to the 1 times x. So the thing is that we have a constant here for our fundamental solution. Now, if you were to take a guess at your y sub p, The right-hand side is a number, so we would guess that it would just be constant. But unfortunately, if it was a constant, then y sub p would just kind of merge into y sub 1. And then you know how you have y sub 1 is going to be c1 times that, and then c2 times y sub 2? Well, the a that you would have found here could just merge with the y sub 1, and then that's not going to give us any extra... Uh, solutions. So, in fact, if you were to take the derivative, there would be zero. Take the derivative again, it'll be zero. So, zero is equal to negative three is not going to work for us. So, we have issues with just setting it equal to what we've what we've known. So, we can't do that. What do you think we could do? What? Or just a times x, just multiply it by x. Is that going to be your answer? <laughs> I don't know. Negative 3x, 3x. So let's make comments here. Uh, this is linearly dependent with one of our fundamental solutions with y sub 1. So we can't use that. And the way to fix linear dependence for these things, since there's some nice patterns happening here, the way to fix that is just to multiply it by an x. So because of this, we're going to just say multiply by x. Well, one, we don't want it to be dependent. And by multiplying it by x, there's a possibility that it won't be dependent anymore. It still might. In which case, you multiply by another x. So the thing is to just keep multiplying by x until it's linearly independent anymore. And the reasoning would be probably coming from the reduction of order. Because you know how we got a, the, the multiple roots, uh, the, the repeated roots? 
and we did the reduction of order, or you did the reduction of order, and we found that if e to the x is one of the answers, then the other one must be x times e to the x. So there's some reduction of order that happens here where it's, it comes up with an x. That's not the official proof. That's just proof by me saying it, which is not in any way a solid proof. Yeah. Yes. We're not switching. We're just multiplying by the easiest thing to multiply by, which is x, to make it not not dependent, to make it not linearly dependent. Okay. Because remember, at the end, we'll jump to the end here briefly. At the end, your general solution is going to start off with C1 times 1 plus C2 times e to the x plus whatever we find here in our second step. Now, if we kept it as A, which is just a constant, then that A just kind of merge in with, just, with this C1 which is not going to give us any new information or anything new for our solution. So we don't want to just keep it at A, and one quick fix is to multiply it by an X. All right, <clears throat> so let's see what this is. And um, I'm happy you already figured it out, but if we do Y sub P prime is going to be A, Y sub P double prime is going to be zero. So then put that in here, we get zero minus a equals negative three. There's no y to put in there. So a is just going to equal a three. But that's not our answer, right? Our answer is y sub p. y sub p is a times x. So y sub p is three x. So that's what we put in here for the y sub p. Say it again? Uh, because of the, the negative sign here. Right? This is easy. Let's check this to make sure it works. We take a couple of derivatives, put it back into the original differential equation, set it equal to 3, and see if it works. We're finally checking an answer here. Color. So let's check. We need the first derivative is uh, derivative constant is, go is gone is zero. We got c two e to the x plus three, and y double prime is going to be c two e to the x, and then that's it. And that's that part's gone. So let's put it back into the original differential equation. Uh, y double prime minus y prime is equal to negative 3. Uh, y double prime is two, c2 e to the x minus y prime is c2 e to the x plus 3. And these things go away and the negative 3 is going to equal to negative 3. So it does work. And had we tried to put a, a just a regular a there, then it wouldn't have worked so well. Okay. Questions? So that's the easier special case. The more difficult ones is that when you end up with a sine and a cosine, or even an e to the x, and then that happens to match your right hand side of your non homogeneous differential equation, in which case, there's a lot more work to do. So see if we can do one of those. Eleven.
11 is more interesting. It has a couple of things going on, uh, or even 10, but I don't know if 10 will result in uh, what we want. Oh yeah, 10 would throw us some curveballs here. <clears throat> Let's try number 10. <laughs> Might need more space. So <clears throat> we don't usually, we usually go through step one first, but I'm going to just going to take a peek at step two um, because there's something interesting here going on. There's a, it's a combination of a polynomial and exponential, but you're not multiplying it, you're just adding it. So you can treat them separately. And so let's uh, take a look at that just to take a peek at our guess, our step two. y sub p should be ax plus b plus c times e to the negative 2x. So if you're adding things, the superposition principle tells us that we can just add them separately and deal with them separately. Okay, But we probably need to change that because I have a feeling that one or a couple of the, of the homogeneous solutions will will match up with one of these things, in which case we have to do something different. So let's uh, figure out the, let's go back and do this in the right order. Step one, deal with homogeneous case. And that is just y double prime plus 2y prime is equal to 0. <clears throat> and then uh, the characteristic equation will have solutions m is equal to 0 and m is equal to negative 2. So we get our y1 is e to the 0, and our y2 is e to the negative 2. e to the negative 2x. <clears throat> so there's a match here with e to the negative 2x. There's also a match with the constant term there. But since the highest term is a linear factor, then I don't think you need to multiply that by x anymore. Because we already have a term with an x out. So this is the only thing that we need to worry about. So there's a match there. Uh, so I can't, cannot use c times e to the negative 2x as part of my solution in my particular, in my as part of my particular solution. So what do I do? <laughs> Multiply it by x. So our particular solution now will change y sub p is equal to ax plus b plus c times x e to the negative 2x. Just by multiplying it by x, it will now become linearly independent from one of the two solutions that we have, and uh, it should work out, hopefully. Yeah, I think we keep the b. I don't know. Yeah, it would. <clears throat> You keep the B. Yeah, 
Yeah, I think we can just get rid of it because it's just uh, an extra constant that's going to be hanging out. Oh, let's get rid of it and see what happens. Oh, yeah, when we solve the system of equations, we're going to need that constant there. Although, the right-hand side just has a, the first derivative, and so I don't think... Uh, Yeah, I think it'll disappear because when we take the derivative, it's going to be gone anyways. Yeah, so we can get rid of that B. Let's just rewrite this then. <laughs> what? Y prime or Y sub P is equal to AX plus b x e to the minus 2x. All right, let's try that. Oh, because the, we got rid of the b, and I don't. I just want to deal with as little of these coefficients as possible. And since we got rid of the b, since it was uh, matching with this constant, then I could, I could have stuck with ax plus c times x e to the x, but... I just prefer A and B, I guess. It's just a number. It's just a constant. So there's matchings that we need to get out. All right, Y prime and Y double prime. A, oh, this is a product rule. Derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. I do that right? I hope so. <clears throat> All right, so uh, I suppose just do one extra step here just to simplify it so that when we take the derivative again, we'll be kind of ready to do the product rule again. So our second derivative Is derivative of a is gone, so that's gone. So uh, derivative of uh, b e to the negative two x is negative two b e to the negative two x, and then now it's going to be a product rule. So derivative of the first minus two b uh, times the second e to the minus two x uh, plus the first plus four. b x e to the negative two x. Yeah. Suppose I can combine these two also. So that's a minus four b e to the minus two x. Yeah, we're gonna have to. Well, this one. Hmm. Or b x e to the minus two x. Ah, I see a problem here. We did it wrong. So instead of just getting rid of b, we actually should have, which is the other thing I was thinking about, should have multiplied by x. Because I'm I'm looking at this, and we're gonna say y double prime plus 2y 2y prime has to equal to this and I'm not I'm not seeing any x components here any x's so I think that was wrong so yeah so I think we need to keep this and it would be a x squared plus bx plus c and then here's you have your x e to well we're multiplying the 
this ax plus b by x because of this uh, constant, and then we're multiplying this by x because of this power. Oh, look at that, we're out of time. So, why don't you guys try it? Figure out what happened. Uh, let's see. If you do it correctly, written neatly on a sheet of paper, take a picture of it and email it to me by, by Sunday night. I'll give you one point on the next test. 11.59. What? Yeah. If you get it wrong, then it's okay. It builds character. Yeah. Is it there? It's not there? Oh. Can you send me an email? All right. See you guys next time. Uh, probably. Oh, yeah, I did. So let's have it on uh, Thursday next week.